What is happening, everybody? Welcome back. Another episode of the Off Track Experience. Now, on this episode of the podcast, I sit down with the absolute legend that is Riley McGilvray. Now, him and me have been friends for years now, and he's also, over the years, become a seven-time Australian National Enduro Champion for motocross. No easy feat, but he has been working his ass off, preparing to go over to America to race the GNCCs and try and make what has been a passion into a full-time gig. So being an athlete like that with an action sports in Australia, it's quite hard to kind of break through. So you have to go to America or Europe to kind of be seen and really make it into a job. So he's currently, when we record this podcast, he was obviously in, in his home before Punker, but now since then he's over in America right now uh, testing and about to get into racing over there. So I sit down with him and talk about all the ins and outs of his racing with Enduro, with being a younger brother kind of and how that benefited him setting, setting him up as being as competitive as he is and just kind of how he's so humble and, and soft-spoken and is someone that has achieved a lot but still doesn't let it get to his head. So it was a really great chat. I really enjoyed it and I hope you guys do as well. Before we get into it though, quick word from the sponsors. If you're not eating enough fruit and veg, I know you're not. I wasn't either, but that's when I got onto Athletic Greens and AG1 has been starting my morning right for the last few months and absolutely love it. Everyone that I give it to always says it tastes better than they think and it's full of whole grain ingredients and it just makes you feel good from start to finish. So if you want to try and spice up your morning, get onto Athletic Greens and let me know what you think. All right, guys, enjoy the pod. It looks what like you've claimed that seat. What seat do you want? Yeah, rock, oh, paper, I think you've already claimed the uh, the lounge chair. Looks like watch. I'm getting the star. Uh, you want the sun lounge? Yeah, the sun bed. Oh, does this, well does this recline back? Oh. Chuck the old foot, the foot rest Can you up. flick it up? Yeah, everybody yeah. Where's the other side? Other side, right here, right? the front. Boom. <laughs> I think it's broken. I think it works, maybe. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Does it go back as well? Oh, I don't know. Oh, what? Oh, brother. That's probably the most... Uh... This is probably going to be the most comfortable <laughs> podcast I've ever done. And I'm not mad about it. <laughs> Perfect. Is, is this the most comfortable one you've done? Oh, I haven't, uh, I definitely haven't laid down a sofa bed to do one. Because you just did... Who did you do the one here with? Um, oh, I've done a few videos and that, and I'm always in that chair, actually. So you've got this one. That's the, uh, that's the old famous video chair. It's been in Ricky Carmichael videos, Chucky, Lee. Really? Everyone, everyone's uh, sat in that chair, to be honest. So I'm kind of with, like, motocross royalty right now. Yeah, pretty well. I'm part of the well. family. 100%. Is this actually their dirty handprints that they've left on it? Yeah, that might have been, uh, that's mine after changing tyres, <laughs> playing with bloody grease and stuff. Have you got them to sign it? Uh, we need to, they've, it's, it's, uh, pretty cool actually thinking about all the people that have been up here over the years, mm. but we've, um, actually just the last person that come up, Jack Simpson, he just won, uh, the work series over in America. Yeah. A lot of the West coast, um, off-road stuff. And he just won the 250 title over there and he's obviously an Aussie and, um, yeah, one of our good friends and he comes up here riding and hanging out and he was up here at hot rod weekend and we're like. Shit, we've got to start one of these uh, sort of fame, oh, not famous people, but like semi-professional uh, or professional uh, athlete uh, try and start like a wall of some sort. Mm. So we've uh, the door over in the back corner of the shed. We're going to start anyone that comes up that's accomplished a bit. We'll get them to sign this wall. And um, obviously in uh, 10, 15, 20 years time, you'll have all these signatures and whatnot there and it'll be uh, pretty cool to look back on. I was going to say, you should get him to sign the couch as well. <laughs> so that, that couch will be chucked out in about a year. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't know if it's going to last that much longer. <laughs> yeah, when someone falls through it, it'll be uh, in, uh, straight up the dip. True. Anyway, Riley McGilvray, welcome to the podcast. Anyway, the comfiest podcast I think we're ever going to do. <laughs> but I was going to say, we're just talking about this place and how a lot of people come here. And I know when I first came here, it was a bit of a shock to the system. It's a little bit of a gem hidden away in poor Punker in Victoria. And I was just going to say, what was it like growing up at this plot, spot? And how do you reckon it's kind of shaped your riding and where you've gotten to now just by being in this area and this place? Yeah, we've been um, super lucky to obviously have a bit of land to grow up on. Um, growing up, I was always, always loved riding dirt bikes, but never thought about taking it any further than just riding around the farm. I 
always had a, a group, good group of close mates that we'd go riding on the weekends and buzz around in the paddocks, make little grass tracks and whatnot. But um, yeah, just tucked out of Port Punka here. There's not a, not a lot of traffic, but um, we've been able to make something pretty special up there. And over the years, obviously, as my riding sort of developed a little bit, um, we've kept adding different pieces, uh, di different bits and pieces along the way. And um, yeah, it's obviously uh, evolved over the years into something pretty cool. And um, yeah, nowadays, obviously, when we're getting a people over to come ride and uh, when they drive up the driveway and park up here pretty well everyone jumps out and just goes uh where yeah, am i yeah, yeah where <laughs> am i this is bloody the coolest spot we've ever been yeah and what was that like though is it because i know when i came here you were like when you were a bit younger you always kind of appreciated and realized that this isn't the normal kind of upbringing for a kid to be like in motocross most people have to like get in the car and drive 45 minutes to an hour to even ride a track that they've got to pay for yeah and you can literally see your track from the back your your, your bedroom you can see your track yeah 100 percent. it's um it's been very lucky to obviously have riding out every uh, every gate of the farm we can go wherever you want and you can go ride and make tracks and do whatnot um and yeah i guess it's definitely not what most people are uh, grow up doing um i'm lucky enough to have land here but a lot of people grow up in uh townhouses in the city or um, yeah, I've got lots of friends down in Melbourne and that uh, race all our Vic, Vic series and um, growing up in the city and having to load your bike up, mm. spend a day, a oh, couple of hours or whatever to drive to a track, obviously, like you said, pay your money, ride and you don't and you go back and you can't necessarily um, do it during the week and um, obviously it just depends on uh, what's going on but I'm lucky enough to sort of have it up straight at my uh, at my will and I can go up there and uh, ride whenever I'd like really um, and yeah it's definitely been beneficial over the years and um, it's sort of paying off now more so than ever. Mm. Do you reckon it's do you is your appreciation changed at all have you ever kind of become a bit complacent and like not looked at it as being as good as it is or is there times where you're like I'd almost rather not be not not be here but you don't kind of you almost need to check yourself and be like, oh no, this is as good as it is. Have you had those moments? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Like you said, sometimes you get a little bit complacent and go to work and come home and go as your day like normal. Um, obviously during the week, we're pretty busy at doing work and everything. And then it's a lot of the time when you get your mates and that up on the weekends that it makes you truly appreciate it. Cause when they show up and they get out and they're looking around going, this is sick. And you sort of you stop, off that, you stop yeah. for a minute and you look around and go, yeah, buddy, oh, this is, uh, yeah. I'm definitely lucky to grow up where I do. And um, yeah, I, I guess I don't, oh, yeah, I haven't really taken it for granted. I guess um, I look out the window every day and it's, um, yeah, it is an unreal spot. And I don't reckon I wouldn't mind moving away and doing it, doing a, my own thing and sort of exploring a little bit. And there's obviously a lot of stuff I want to do growing up. But um, I always reckon I'll come back and mm. I'll make sure mum and dad don't sail off the farm, that's for sure. <laughs> Dude, it's funny though how you say it's like other people give you that appreciation back. Yeah. Because they'll see how good something is and it makes you stop and realise. Yeah. It's like sometimes what you think is the not the worst, but you look at something as not being that good and then you see someone come in and like that's all they want. Like yeah. they'd, tra they'd trade anything for your situation and then you go, oh shit. And like more people than not would want to trade this kind of lifestyle and what you've been able to have for what they've had yeah so. def it definitely uh makes you stop and appreciate what i've got here like mm. yeah do you, do you find it almost in a way though did you ever feel like it put more pressure on you because you had all the tools to obviously create this lifestyle that you're going for with like racing um enduro motocross did you feel like it's more on you then because your excuses got limited because you had the resources in front of you? Yeah, I guess I've never, I don't like to consider myself someone to make up excuses for not, for not doing well. And I, yeah, we've, but we've been very fortunate obviously to have what we do, but um, at the end of the day, it's, uh, it's whoever works the hardest. And obviously you'd know that in your racing. Um, although we do have what we've got, anyone can train hard and do what, no, to get to the top. So um, I guess I don't. I don't like putting pressure on myself. It's sort of I just I like riding dirt bikes, and I mm. just go go about it like that. Um, if I didn't like riding, I just wouldn't do it. As simple as that. So um, when I'm going to the races, I'm there to have fun. Mm. Um, and obviously, uh, obviously, yeah. Towards the end of the season, when it's all championships and that, um, 
it gets a little bit stressful, but it's more about just making sure you hit all your marks. And I know at the end of a weekend, if if you ride well, you're happy with how you rode, whether it's a first or a third, like I'm stoked if I know I've put in a good weekend, where even if I win, if, if I know I've just been making mistakes all weekend and not mm. sort of riding to where I need, I, I know I should be, um, well, yeah, that's that's more more of a letdown than anything else. Well, it's you versus you, dude. Yeah, the 100%. whole time everyone thinks they're competing against all these other people, and like they don't matter. They're just extra characters in the game that is life. And it's like it's well, your best is your best, 100%. and you should be happy with your best. Yeah, it's like all these people get annoyed when they don't win, but I'm like, did you give it your all? And you're like, yeah. I'm like, that's all you've got right now. You go back to the drawing board, and then your all gets better. Yeah, but you can't get angry at yourself for not. Like you can't control the finishing results. You can just control the amount of work you put in. Yeah. It's like if you put in all that work and you get third, but you're like, that was me. Like that was I, and you should be happy with that though. It's like people don't get happy with this result and they just say they get third or fifth or whatever. But they like, you ask them like, oh, that was my best. Yeah. So be happy with your best. Like your best is your best. Your best doesn't always have to win. You can, you can only do what you can do. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, we're obviously all there for the exact same thing. We all go ride bikes because it's fun. And mm. we all started at the same place. So obviously, um, yeah, everyone, everyone's there doing the same thing. And if you ride your best, you should be happy with it. And that's sort of how I've always been. Um, just go there and do what you can. and. Um, yeah, that's it. Do you hold yourself at a pretty high standard with that though? Like, do you feel like if you don't hit a certain mark that you will feel let down? Yeah, I, I guess it's in the last few years, yes, that's definitely the case. Um, obviously, I've got a great support network around me now and we've put a lot into it. So that's pretty well, like I see how hard my parents work and I know the money and the time and the effort. And obviously the effort of everyone around that supports me. We, we put in a lot of days with Jonesy and um, like tune tech suspension and obviously all the KDM group and everyone, everyone all the, anything on me bike, they all obviously put in a lot of time and money and effort and um, that sort of, yeah, rides on your shoulders a little bit. Like I feel, I feel like I've got an expectation now. I've mm. got enough good results that if I drop below that, that shouldn't, it's not where I should be. Even if I know I've ridden good, it's sort of, oh, something must be wrong, like that's mm. not where he normally is, so... Um, but you've got to be careful with that mindset because the expectation you put on yourself will also take away from that, okay, I did my best. Yeah. Because it's like you set an expectation on yourself and then you don't meet that, like that can be pretty crushing, but it's like, okay, I need to, like you can f obviously figure it out if you're not hitting the marks that you need to hit, but it's one of those things where people get so robbed of this like happiness and joy in their racing because they're like, okay, I'm expected by sponsors, by family, by friends, to get this and yeah. I got that and then they're suddenly so bummed and it's like how it's it's a tricky mindset of okay understanding that you want to be driven and you want to and have expectations because everyone needs expectations on the thing but yeah. if you don't reach them also being like okay what do I need to do to reach them but not being so hard on yourself yeah and that's gotta, tricky and that's yeah. that's real tricky 100% you got to be happy with wherever you finish up Obviously, yeah, like I said, if you ride well, you need to be happy with where it is. And I feel like I'm at the stage now where, yeah, if, I, if I'm doing my best and that's where, it, where I end up on the boards, um, yeah, I'm happy with it. Mm. Obviously, um, the good results look better on paper, but at the end of the day, that's not really, uh, not really the issue at all, no. Mm. Do you ever do like, I, I heard this thing David Goggins got me onto it. It's like an after action report. And it's like after a race, I started doing it at races. And it's like after a race, you just go through and make lists of things that you um, that you thought you did really well and then things that you thought you did really bad and you just go through that list and mark them off and then it's like okay you know what you're doing right and you know what you're doing wrong and you can see it and I felt like something like that in a race weekend if you don't do what you expect it's like analyze it like yeah. dissect it take it apart and then you know it's like all right well what I, went well what did it yeah it's what like, I need to work on yeah it's like I was stressed because of I didn't have enough food packed or I got a flat tire because I wasn't running the right prep like it's like you can really just fine-tune your results and your racing and like but you can do that with anything it's not just racing but it's like it's such a you think about how often everyone does their suspension settings and they fine-tune their suspension to be perfect but yeah. then they don't fine-tune themselves to be Fooding perfect and preparation yeah and like heap yeah yeah exactly that definitely uh i don't do it but i should do a lot more of it it's um like you said there's so many benefits that can come out mm. of sort of just analyzing stuff a little bit more you it, the closer you look the more different things you'll work Fine, out yeah. like you said 
we uh, focus so hard on the bikes, but not necessarily yourself and the preparation. Um, on a race weekend more so, obviously, well, there's a lot of mental stuff that can un uh, unscramble a lot of people, but um, yeah, just keep it on top of stuff and your food and your eating and everything is, uh, yeah. You seem pretty chill with your mental game. Have you always been like that? Like you seem pretty, I would say like obviously focused, but just more chill, like relaxed with it. Has that always been the case? Yeah, I, I reckon, I re yeah, I like to, I like to stay chill like that. Um, yeah, I don't like putting pressure on myself. I like riding bikes because I like riding bikes, and that's sort of that's sort of it. Um, you go to the races now, and and I'm, I'm a really competitive person, so I, I like that side of things more than necessarily winning. At the end of the day, you win a race, and everyone's cheering you on more, and you you don't sort of I don't get as excited over a win as what I would during the day battling back and forward with someone going, oh, this is pretty sick. Like, um, there's a couple seconds between it going back and forward. And that's that's where the pressure gets put on you and you're sitting on the start line, obviously, and you're like, you know what you got to do, but so easily you can tuck the front end and lose a lot of time like that. And it's, although you can make it up if it comes right down to the last uh, the last tests like it has this year and both the, uh, the state titles and the my nationals that come down to the last few sprints. Mm. Um, so it's, uh, I finished both years or both se series off as hard as hard as the way I, I probably could. Mm. Um, but at the end of the day, looking back, it was, uh, made the days that more, that, that much more exciting and memorable. Cause you were tested. Yeah. hundred percent. You were pushed and tested. Yeah. There's so many people that have, uh, come up since the race and gone, I don't know how you could, uh, like deal with it. Like there's yeah. a couple seconds going into it. It's the whole year. Yeah going into this final result and uh, obviously you had to hold it together and it's so easy to tuck the front or just spin up and yeah. there's there's seconds like just clicking away easy as, as easy as that. That's literally why you want to do it. Yeah, 100%. Like, I read this thing the other day and I really, I keep thinking about it all the time, but it talks about how like achieving the goal won't give you fulfillment. It's like the obstacles you have to overcome to achieve that goal is, is what is going to give you true fulfillment. So like the struggle and the hardship and being that close and being a second within a whole year, all that stuff, well, that's exciting. Like yeah. if you went to the first race and won by like, some just say stupid amount like an hour or something and you're like oh i can just maintain this for the rest of the year it'd be a boring year yeah like if you were that far ahead going in like it doesn't make it exciting when it's exciting and when it tests you and pushes you and you kind of go okay what's inside what am i made of is when it has those real small minute gaps that you're like all right well i need to show up now yeah and then you and if you do show up and nail it like you said it's enjoyable Oh, because you fun. get in that like kind of flow state, you're riding at your best ability. It's like yeah. you have to go now. Yeah. And it's like I don't think you can get that without being in a competition or being having people push you. Yeah, hundred percent. That's why it's so much more uh, addictive than just riding up in the bush, for instance. Um, like I said, I'm super competitive, and as much as riding up there on the track and cruising around is fun, I'm always. Uh, always had a bit of competition. I want, if I'm riding up there on my own, I want someone out on the stopwatch so I can <laughs> sort of battle against myself because you don't want to ever be on backwards. So you want to make sure obviously you're progressing and um, that's sort of another thing as I've sort of developed into racing a lot more. Um, yeah, I, I like uh, always having a bit of friendly competition, whether it's, if you go bush riding, um, yeah, Milner's obviously really good for it over Christmas, he does, we go for a trail ride and then we'll pop into a track and we'll go, oh, right, oh, we'll do a push-up challenge. Every time you put your foot down, that's a push-up. Yeah. So it's stuff like that where, although you're not necessarily versing each other, there's always a bit of competition there. Yeah. And you know, like gives you something to obviously work on and get better at that sort of stuff. Mm. Do you reckon as well, talking about competition, being the younger brother, <laughs> how, did, how did that go growing up? And because obviously Paddy races as well. Yeah. How do you f find that went competing against him from literally the time you were born? Yeah, I don't think a, uh, enough credit gets given to him for how I've turned out, I guess. Mm. Forever, I've always obviously, oh, I'm always going to be the little brother. And I've mm. grown up, he's always been a lot faster than I have. And I was always just trying to watch watch what he does and chip away and you're always trying to obviously catch up with him catch up with him catch up with him always and um 
I definitely uh, got to give him a little bit of credit. It's definitely uh, sort of boosted the progression, I guess. Um, if I didn't have an older brother there sort of revving you up and for not doing some stuff or not... Uh, Just beating you. Yeah, that's right. Beating, beating you. you over and over and over again. It all builds you, resilience. All you want to do growing up is uh, beat your older brother. Like <laughs> It's sort of... Um, yeah, it's it's uh, definitely sort of boosted to where I am now. And even even now, obviously, we're both racing. Um, yeah, it's good to be able to sort of have someone up there as well to push and and then like watch off and learn some different things and you can bounce ideas back and back and forward from each other and it's definitely uh sort of helped us both get up to where we are now mm. yeah it's that that back and forth i always tell parents they always I've, I've mentioned this all the time but parents always ask me oh how do i get like a fast kid or how do i get my kids to be faster and i say have two kids and focus on the second one because <laughs> it's and it's just like it's just like human nature like the second one it's like from the moment you were born you are the you, little brother you are, you're always you're a, just trying to be. You're an underdog, yeah. yeah. And it comes back to that thing. It's like you want to make a good athlete. They need to lose a lot, like yeah. a lot. And they need to become okay with losing because once they become okay with losing and they can accept it, that's when you go, okay. And it's not like okay with losing in the fit, like you give up. It's like, okay, I'm losing. How do I get better? Yeah. In that sense, it's like not that oh, I'm losing, poor me, give up, go home. It's like, okay, I'm losing. How do I keep showing up? What do I do? And then you find ways to overcome that. It's like, I need to train more. I need to eat better. I need to tune my bike better. And it's like, each time you lose, you go, okay, how do I level up again? How do I get better? Yeah. And I think from you and Patty, it's like, you've had that your entire life. And then you get to that point where it's like, okay, I've found all these tools within myself that I can use. And then you go like, it's like, you see with, you should always like, when people have kids, like your kids should always be a better version of you. Yeah. realistically like they should transcend what you are because you've learned all these lessons to pass on yeah. and I guess a younger and older brothers are similar obviously it's not the same but it's similar it's like you should be better because you're learning from him yeah like he's more of a he like older brothers play more of a leadership role and then you're obviously learning so it's like you're gonna level up a lot quicker yeah You've every obviously... success that he has I'm learning off and every mistakes mm. that he have I'm also learning off yeah. so like you said I should I should be learning from everything that he does, mm. whether good or bad, and exactly. obviously keep chipping away and getting better and better. And I'm sure it's frustrating for older brothers because it's yeah. like you got this little kid that's like getting better and through your flaws and your successes. Yeah, so they're like, seeing that and they're like, just like fuck off. Yeah, kind of anything thing. I do and he's just sort of copying it. Yeah, 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 exactly. 100%. I was, yeah, I was going to say as well because obviously Patty being here, but you said there's been so many people come to this place. How has that kind of fallen into to place with just so many, like you said, Ricky Carmichael's been here, uh, Milner's been here. Like, how does the connection all work? It just seems like this kind of just attracts top motocross, either races, enduro, motocross, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, well, we've, um, at the end of the day, it's it's through the connections we've made. Um, dad's dad's got a dad used to race back in the day as well, and he's got a lot of uh, great mates that obviously now have grown up to be uh, in the industry. And um, growing up in the place that we do, obviously, Bright's a massive tourist town, and um, and it's very well renowned for obviously all the sightseeing and everything that it has to offer. And uh, yeah, we've been lucky enough. One of our uh, really good family friends, Scotty Runsman, he's the big one of the big bosses at Alpine Stars um, used to work at Fox, and that's uh, he's been a pretty well one of the uh, major players for getting a few of those guys up here, um, doing uh, like video shoots and that for obviously all the brands. And um, yeah, and through his connection with that, he goes, "Oh, this place would be an awesome spot to uh, obviously film these videos." And then they come up one time, and they obviously have a great time, and we're the sort of people would obviously uh try and welcome on uh new people and motorbike all that like motorbike sort of uh the crew as well as we can so obviously mm. we want everyone coming back um especially people like him if they're coming over from the states and obviously as well renowned as he is um if he's coming over to your house you want to try and make it the best day you can have and um because you guys uh, are doing tours and stuff from here weren't you yeah yeah so we've done uh Little Lee Hogan's done a lot of his um, Honda like adventure bike tours. The high country tours. That's yeah. right, all his high country tours. And since um, since Ricky's come up, Dad's been over to America for two, 
three or two or three times now, and um, obviously going over there and doing their uh, they do a triumph tours over there, and obviously um, with a pretty cool bunch of blokes over there, so, and he's he's making the connections, mm. and um, yeah, I'm hoping obviously uh, through him and obviously myself and making my own connections, you know, people all around the world, so when I can eventually try and get a bit of money together and do a bit of traveling to try and do some racing and that, I can sort of know a few people and have a bit of a hand wherever I go. Mm. So talking about racing, what are your actual, like what's the resume? What, cause you're, I saw in your, your seven time enduro national champion. Yeah. And what, like in Vic champion as well, I would take it, that would be. Yeah, yeah, well I won a, Vic outright this year which is pretty special and I was my first one I've I've only been in seniors for three years now so my first year first year I got seventh outright in the Victorian series and then last year I got third outright and then this year I'm lucky enough obviously to to win it outright which is pretty special and that's um something a lot of people work a lot of years towards and I feel like Obviously, I've just kept chipping away, and you can see that in the results. I've been in there for three years, and every result's just bumped up, bumped up, bumped up, mm -hmm. and that's obviously where I want to continue that sort of trend. Um, and you can see it the same thing at all the nationals in the outright standings. Although I'm doing well in my class, I'm always looking at the outrights because that's what matters at the end of the day. Um, where where you come outright is sort of where you want to be. Um, and just kept, yeah, to keep moving forwards. Where did you come out this year in the nationals for the outrights? Uh, six, the outright. Six. Which is uh, not too bad, I guess, for uh, someone that goes to work Monday to Friday. And uh, yeah, obviously I, I do as much as I can, but compared to some of the others, it's a lot, lot less than what they do. Everyone in front of you, are they on factory rides? Yeah, pretty well, yeah. So who, there's- Who are the guys, the guys that won it and well, Top five. Um, Greeny won outright. Um, he's obviously it's his full-time yeah. job to uh, race race bikes, and obviously he's got a, a lot of time where he can train and ride. And uh, above me is obviously Corey Mark McMahon on a Gas Gas, and Kyron's on a on a Yamaha, and uh, Jonty on the Sherco. Yeah. Jonty does a lot of work, and then um, obviously train. Oh, they all train and obviously do a bit of work on the side. But those top few. Um, yeah, I have a lot more time to sort of designate to go riding and training and that sort of thing. And I'm hoping, obviously, now you, the more support you get, you can take a little bit of time off work mm. to go do that sort of thing. And, and I, yeah, I reckon, obviously, the more time I can sort of put towards it, the better I'll get. You sort of, you get, you get what you pay for a little bit. Mm. Um, and as much as I've got to go to work, it's sort of, it is play, it pays an impact obviously on your riding side of things, but you gotta gotta do what you gotta do to obviously make some money and keep the dream alive. Mm. My biggest thing that I found was it's just recovery and fatigue. Yeah. Because if you're training as hard as you need to train to be at the top, you need to eat, eat, like have an equal recovery each day and if you're going to work that's just feeding into your recovery time so mm. it's like your schedule needs to be all right i'm training x amount i'm riding x amount i'm resting x amount and if you're going to work that just that just eats into your recovery and you just can't train at that same level yeah there's definitely uh not much recovery we've got a pretty flat out lifestyle going to the races obviously racing all weekend at an off-road we race on a saturday and a sunday um, and then we obviously drive back as how, late as... How exactly do the races work? So just talk us through, because it's just full enduro. How exactly do the... Because I know there's different shootouts and stuff and stages. So just yep. say, talk us through, you get there on the Saturday, how the actual race schedule works. It depends on what race um, we go to. At, a, at enduro in Australia, we got three different formats. So we got they call what they call sprints, and we go do a cross country, and then they've also got a proper... Uh, old school like time card enduro. Um, the easiest way to describe to you what a time card enduro is, it's pretty well like an enduro mountain bike race. You've got your transport sections. Mm. Um, only difference is we've got a time card, so you have to be at certain checkpoints by time. So it's a little bit strategic as well. If you, you can't go into a checkpoint early or late, so you have to be there on the minute, otherwise you get penalised however many minutes you are on either side. Um, and then obviously once you get to a special test, 
um, you pull up and that's the same thing as a mountain bike race. Obviously that's, that's what gets timed, your special test, um, start to finish. And then you've got another transport section to the next test. Which isn't timed, obviously. Yeah, which, yeah. which isn't timed. Yeah. So at the end of the day, they've always got check, or X amount of checkpoints. Um, and you have, you, ha you have to ride swiftly because you have to be there in that time period. Mm. But it's not necessarily time. So all you have to do is just make sure you're there on time. What would a, what would a stage be? How long would a stage be? Um, like a special test? Yeah. Uh, anywhere between 7 to 15 20 minutes yeah. it sort of just depends on where you are and what sort of track they've set up and how many special tests we've got during the day every state sort of got their own way of uh what they like to do some states do more tests and shorter tests some ones do longer and less tests and obviously um over the day you usually do let's say three laps of the whole track and if there's two tests that you do on a lap you do six tests during the day obviously not including all the transport sections. So you're pretty well riding all day, mm. but there's six time tests that get timed that go towards your obviously yeah, uh, overall, yeah. overall What do result. you prefer? Um, get the pick. <laughs> depends how I'm feeling during the year, but yeah. obviously sprints are obviously, uh, you're fresh, you go out there and just go as hard as you can for a sort of 15 minutes-ish. And then you come back in and you pretty well have to be lined up by the time the slowest rider comes back in, the top guys have to be up there waiting again. And you get a sweep rider comes around, obviously make sure the track's clear. And then you go again and you pretty well do them all day. Mm. And then we also do a cross country, which is you start off in a grid. They always do a dead engine start for off roads. So your bikes are off, flag drop, obviously you start up and then you got a three hour um yeah three hours of racing as fast as you can obviously banging bars back and forward um and that's obviously a massive one uh where you got to put in a lot into your preparation we obviously wear camel packs and you got to stra like strategically do all your uh pit stops and just make sure everything works there's a lot of uh a lot of things to think about over a three hour and you've probably got to be you got to be a lot more fit to be able to ride as fast as you can for three hours rather than a 15 minute sprint a lot of um a lot of fast riders that have sort of or even motocross riders that are used to doing their 20 minute motos they cross over to an off-road and they can be fast for a sprint mm. but um it definitely shows your your fitness in the cross country sort of thing so i don't i do actually like them all for different reasons mm. I, i've uh, i used to be probably slower you know, you sprint stuff, but I've, over the years, I like to think I've gotten a little bit faster. Mm -hmm. So I do enjoy doing sprints now and I feel like I'm pretty competitive and that sort of thing. But um, I like to think that uh, I can sort of tough it out and do those cross countries and um, sort of the mental strength a little bit more. Everyone's fit, but being able to push through the dust or whatever sort of weather and conditions we're mm. sort of faced with, I like to think a cross country is probably my favourite anyway. Have you had any good battles when you've been doing the cross country? Yeah, there's there's too many races to probably even remember. But, but is there any like real like? Hit yeah, I honestly reckon my my first my first uh, Victorian um, round win. Yeah. Um, like overall was uh, at a track called Dartmoor down near the SA border. Yeah. And um, yeah, obviously I'd never never won an outright at in like the state series before and. Um, and we did these, uh, it was a sprint format, but they did it a little bit different for that round where it was sort of like a motocross start and we're doing a 20 minute moto. We had two different motos. And um, yeah, I was just battling back and forward with uh, Sammy Prashiro, who's one of my good mates from Mildura. So it was good fun, obviously, as well as your mate. And I, uh, I didn't necessarily get the jump, but I was sitting right behind him. And obviously we we're just battling back and forward the whole, the whole race and it was, um, pretty exciting and obviously when you come past swing past the pits and everyone's there watching <laughs> yeah. and uh, every lap they're obviously waiting to see who's in front which lap so it was um that's probably one of my mem most memorable uh sort of battles i guess um in in that sort of uh format but um yeah even even in the sprint formats with times this year at the nationals stefan granquist and i came down i think we had I think it was like nine seconds or something then it going into that last sprint, which is pretty well a crash. You, you lose about eight seconds probably if you drop the bike. 
and I knew he was sort of, uh, oh, it's hard, just hard to know where you're at. So you, you got such a long test. If you have two little mistakes, that's it. So I was sort of just, um, although I had a tiny little gap, it was anyone's game and, and uh, yeah, going into that last sprint, I was obviously, it was a good battle and um, yeah. It's pretty cutthroat, hey, for how like long it actually is, you can't make that many mistakes. Really. Yeah, you race all day and at the end of the day, it comes down to a couple seconds. It's, uh, it blows your mind so out. It's frustrating, hey, you like, you'd have yeah. the best motor of the day, but then I guess it just with anything, even with like the mountain bike enduro, it comes down to seconds. Yeah. You know, like how can half an hour and an hour or however long you've been racing come down to seconds when you've, it's, you lose a bit here, gain a bit there, lose a bit there. It's pretty. It shows how, how close it really is and shows that everyone's obviously pushing as fast as you can and it shows the limits of the track almost when everyone's pushing as fast as you can and you got five guys all within mm. five or six seconds you know you know it's all pretty you know where close. they're at yeah I just, I just need to check something real quick because, you're all right because one thing i've learned with these things um they love to they love to overheat and i always forget to to do this we're still on um i was gonna ask as well Oh, talking about, you are saying this year, like you've obviously leveled up. Did you feel like there was a big change this year going in? Did you do anything different in preparation or did it just feel right? Like, Yeah, every, every year I try and um, obviously work harder than I did the year before. I know, I know that what I've done during the year has got me this result and whether I was happy with it or not, I want to do better. So obviously, um, yeah, coming in every year, I try and do more and more and more. And obviously I've sort of, yeah, like I said, we've built built what we have around and I keep investing in bits and pieces. Last year I finished up at school um, and yeah, so I thought I'd, thought I'd have probably more time to do a bit of riding than that. And I uh, yeah, invested in like a cycle bike. So that's probably been uh, beneficial for me. And um, yeah, just taking, taking sort of the gym side and stuff a little bit more seriously. I've always enjoyed going to the gym and keeping fit and obviously doing a lot of sports and that sort of thing, but um, focusing and know, know what to like, what to focus on and what not to and how to prepare for events and that sort of thing. I've obviously with experience, you just get more and more and more knowledge on that sort of thing. And that's probably, yeah, overall where, where it's sort of, I keep getting better and better and, and like I'd, I'd hope I'd get better over the years. The more and more I'm riding, you want to be always getting better. So, because mm. um, you're only 19. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I've, I've still got a long time to go, and <laughs> I've and yeah, although I can ride a dirt bike, this is I've got so much more to learn. And whenever I've got other mates up riding, I've always just sort of anyone that rides quick, I'm always just wanting to watch what they're doing. Like it's just it's interesting to me what what they do different to what I do and. And, it, and if you see them do different sort of line choices, you'd think in your head, oh, well, why are they doing that? I'll, and you just you just go try it. Like, mm. there's no harm in trying. Some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. But um, mm. being able to uh, sort of pull things apart and, and uh, yeah, watch what everyone else is doing, um, yeah, is that's definitely a, beneficial, I reckon. That's just a good life lesson, really. Yeah, yeah. I don't think you, yeah, you can use that and take that from riding and just put that anywhere. But Learn it so, from everyone else. Yeah, I heard this thing. It's like everyone you meet is an expert at something you don't know nothing about. Yeah. So if you actually treat them like that and try and get something out of them instead of just going, oh, you're whatever, and kind of brushing it aside, you go, okay, I can probably learn something from you. Yeah, but If 100%. you do that with your racing or your riding, because I know that I'm a similar thing. I'll watch people ride and I almost mimic it in a way. Or like if I see them like, oh, they're like on their heels more or, oh, they break like there, but they break more with like, you can kind of find little bits and pieces. Yeah, 100%. And you see how they ride and their body position and stuff and even how their bikes are set up. Yeah. And you kind of, you're always, you're like you're curious. You're really curious to go, well, why are you doing that? And yep. you're winning so that probably works and you kind of like it's not so much copying but it's just yeah being curious and like just trying new things and like you say if you're watching people and picking up on those things it can be so beneficial because you might try something someone else is doing and you're like oh that's way better but you can get stuck in your rut sometimes about like this is how it's done this is how i've always done it 
this is the right way and you and that can be really um temperamental to the actual like your progression in something yeah 100 percent. it's um definitely something i've always sort of grown up doing i never did heaps of coaching i did a, i did a few years there i did a little bit of coaching with um a, a motocross coach in melbourne um but growing up i was always uh yeah super curious like you said um and i used to watch a lot of a lot of motorbike videos i'd sit there on youtube uh probably at school when i should be doing other things <laughs> i'd sit there and just be watching motorbike videos and uh obviously there's so much uh <laughs> a lot i was just watching there and just seeing what other people are doing i'd be like oh that's pretty sick i'll go up and try that and uh and yeah that's probably how i sort of learned to do a lot of things in the most part i was just watching videos wondering why people are doing certain things and sort of the body postures and sitting on different parts like sort of weighting your pegs and moving around and watch yeah that sort of stuff mm. and i notice as well you try and help a lot of other people progress in their riding like whenever we'd go riding here or be around other people you'd be like try this and oh if you do that and i've i've, I've heard if you teach someone good technique then that actually comes back on yourself because yeah. if you reinforce to other people it helps you learn as well yeah. so it's like the more you help someone else the better you get it's yeah. such a good flow and effect it's like the perfect <laughs> kind of you're creating a perfect storm you're all leveling up at the same time but i remember you do that a lot if you was either sammy or me or whoever was here and you'd just be like kind of watching how we would ride even if we're not riding to the above your level you're still trying to look at that as well and you're yeah. like this is what you're doing wrong and then that will help you as well yeah. have you always been someone that's just been that like you just you try and figure out kind of everything out i guess yeah well you can definitely uh read in the crowd some people like con constructing criticism uh some people don't um but obviously i've learned over the years learned a lot of stuff and um i'm always trying to ask people if someone sees me doing something wrong, i want them to tell me yeah. what i'm doing like if i always when we have people up and going oh is there anything you reckon i can probably do like am i coming in slow here should i is there something i should be doing um and obviously i i want that i want people to criticize how i'm sort of doing stuff and and i feel like uh everyone else that's sort of riding as well i, I want to be helping you guys as well if there's something that's oh I just you should be trying this and um like doing different things and obviously the, that flow state that you always talk about once you start hitting all your marks it it feels unreal so um mm. yeah trying to well just help everyone get as best they can um yeah it makes you feel good and obviously get closer um, to that state it hey? makes you think about it as obviously as well if you're if you're telling someone to do something the next time you come around you're going oh i'm like am, am i doing that probably as best i could um and yeah it makes you obviously you assess your riding while you're doing it and trying to trying to yeah focus on a few different things to make you go better you always got to keep you accountable hey yeah so if you tell someone to do something then you're not doing it you're yeah. like oh shit what am i what am i doing now yeah 100 percent. it keeps you accountable for sure there's a lot of a lot of different things i sort of swear by when riding bikes like weighting your pegs and trying to keep your elbows up coming into corners to like absorb all your bumps and whatnot um there's a lot of different sort of things i think about when i ride and and although it comes natural, um, if I even at the races, if I'm riding a little bit sloppy and sort of rushing things and not doing what I should be doing, I'm not, like I know how it should feel, mm. but if I'm not hitting all my marks, then you sort of got to tone it back a couple of percent and think about right, I would have like go back to the basics a little bit and think about that while you're riding, and yeah, pretty soon after you sort of jump back into flowing along. It's like slowing down to go fast. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. Now, you were saying before, obviously you're working full time as well as training and racing. Obviously KTM help you out as well as other sponsors you mentioned before. But obviously you're, you're not getting paid right now to race enduro or? You get good, you get bonus. Bonuses and stuff like that. If, if you do well, they help you out. Yeah. Um, but there's not a, you're not on a set salary for a year. No, nah, there's no set salary. Like yeah. they, they, they're definitely very supportive and and yeah, we always keep keep working forward. So every year it gets better and better. Um, mm. But yeah, at the moment, obviously, I can't afford to sort of be a full time racer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm going to work Monday to Friday. Obviously, doing as much as I can. Um, Trying to go to the gym a few nights a week. Try and cycle and do a lot of running and that sort of thing. But um, 
yeah, I'm obviously super appreciative that everyone that does, does help put out. In, yeah. Um, and yeah, obviously it goes a long way because I can't obviously afford it without everyone. Mm. But the goal now, because you mentioned before, you're going to America in three weeks' time. Yeah. And you, you want to race the GNCCs? Yeah. Over there. And there was another race that you're doing as well? Yeah, full gas sprints. Full gas sprints. Is, would that be a goal if you could go over there and kind of make a name for yourself? Would you move over to the States and race more GNCCs? And obviously that's where a lot more of the money is yeah. and a realistic career. Yeah, yeah. Well, my, my dream is obviously to race bikes as, as much as I like doing doing what I'm doing at the minute. I enjoy doing my apprenticeship and I'm obviously interested in it, otherwise I wouldn't be doing it. But um, yeah, obviously motorbikes is my dream and I want to keep trying to make a career in it. I'm still obviously young and as long as I'm sort of doing well and have a bit of backing behind me to sort of being able to afford it and uh, yeah, keep doing well, I want to try and, try and push as much as I can while I'm young, designate like these next few years to try and make a name for myself, go over to the States and obviously um, try and make some connections. And I know I'm obviously not going to go over there and win, but I'd also... Why not? Also, that's right, but I also don't want to go over there and say, right, I'm happy for whatever. I want to go over there and do as best I can. Yeah. Um, obviously not expect a lot of myself, but I want to go over there and do as well as I can. Yeah, and, learn um, and experience it. Yeah. yeah, and experience it. Obviously, I've got so much to learn being young and even if I can push hard, my goal is just to go out there swinging those first few laps and just get a toe along by those f fast guys for as long as I can. That's that's what I want to go over there and do. Even if I gas out before the end, if I've sat behind those front runners for the X amount of time or a couple laps or whatever, then I know what I need to work on and um, mm. I feel like that'll be super beneficial to me. Um, obviously experiencing it the first time sort of traveling overseas on your own will be the hardest. And uh, yeah, I know the more prepared I, I am, obviously it'll make it a bit easier, but um, yeah, I just want to get over there and sort of do it. Will you get support over there through KTM when you go over? Yeah, yeah, they, um, they're helping out organize a bike and that sort of stuff. Um, but everything else is pretty well on their own. Um, obviously Alpine Star are super supportive, so I can go over there and gear and all sort of all up my gear and tyres and oils and obviously sorting out a bike isn't necessarily the issue. It still costs a lot of money, but um, it's not really an issue sort of source and all that sort of stuff. And I've got a few connections over there to find, uh, to get tanks and quick fills, but it's all, all the little stuff like uh, accommodation, mm. um, travel, like you, you got to have, we're going to have to hire a U-Haul obviously to try and um, for transport. And then little things like jerry cans and toolboxes and just the stuff that you sort of take for granted working out of your own shed. You go over there and you're back to square one. You've got to mm. sort of go to the track and, oh, hey, mate, can I use, yeah, can so I use something make, out of your you, toolbox? You're going to have to make friends. Yeah, you're going to have to go. I'll have to go over there and make a lot of friends, um, try and stay at someone's house for a few nights and then go to someone else's house for a few nights and sort of um, find different tracks to ride, obviously, around here on everywhere there is to go. But... Mm. Over there, it's something, uh, something I'm completely new to me. Obviously, that's exciting though. Hey, yeah, you don't 100%. know. You have no idea. No idea. I just go over there and get a bike and a and a van and um, drive around <laughs> and make it work. Obviously, I've got a bit of a plan. I know yeah. where I'm staying at the start, and obviously, um, trying to uh, yeah base it off that and just see where it sort of see where it goes. What do you think is going to be the biggest challenge? Um, going over. It'll just be the whole lifestyle sort of change. Obviously, I'm living at home, so I've got mum always looking after me. <laughs> um, but going over there, I'll be on my own. I'll be doing all my own washing, uh, <laughs> all my own cooking, driving around, making sure I have to organise everything, all the race entries and everything. Like, there's a lot of stuff I take for granted. I love it how the, the biggest challenge is not the racing at all. Like no. The racing is the easy bit, isn't it? Yeah, well, I know how to ride a bike, <laughs> so I can just go over there and race. It's living. Living's yeah. the hard bit. Yeah. That's yeah. the best bit, though. Yeah, 100%. 100%. <laughs> no, that, that's going to be awesome, though, because the first time you go over and do something like that, no matter how many times you do it, you only get that first time once. Yeah. So no matter how, even if you do really well afterwards, it's still not quite as the same as the first time. 
because the first time is just it's just it's different yeah it's, it's completely new. new it's something i've never sort of experience and i'm lucky enough i've got one of my good mates coming along with me mm. so um i'm not not fully on my own there i've got one of my mates coming with me to obviously hang out and um and be a bit of a support person he can be there to spin spanners or be there to obviously help along all the training sort of stuff and get the stopwatch out and um yeah it'll be good having someone there obviously with me to so it's not fully on your own, but um, yeah, it's something completely new and I'm obviously super excited to do it. No, that's going to be epic. I think you're going to have a, you're going to have the best time, eh? It's yeah. all going to be new, you're going to be with your mate, you're just going to, yeah, just soak up as much as you can. Like just yeah. get, like just learn, like just go over there and like you said, don't have a massive expectation except I want to learn as much as I can and, yeah. and it's all going to be different, which is going to be cool, but yeah. it's also going to be different, which is going to be challenging, but I think it's going to be good. A hundred percent. What do you think? What do you think motors like racing motor, um, enduro motocross, and just motocross in general? What do you think the biggest thing it's taught you? I reckon just if you're working hard, where like where it can take you, it obviously shows you that a bit of hard work and dedication can go a long way. Um, there's so many, uh, obviously, so many people that put into it and I, I can see and I appreciate the amount of time and effort and you can see especially from my parents and I see how hard everyone works obviously to make the dream happen and that's not just necessarily for motorbikes obviously if for whatever you do or sporting or whatever the harder you work the more you get out of it and obviously that's sort of I feel like it's reflected on me I know that I've got to work for everything that I ever get um, I've never, although we've been fortunate, uh, my parents don't just give me things. So I've need to uh, obviously work, work to be able to get, get somewhere. And um, same thing with race. And obviously if I was sort of just not really taking it seriously, it would have been so easy for me to get caught up. Obviously in the old, the 18 year old thing, obviously it's great to have fun and go out and have fun, fun with your mates and whatnot. But if you're out there doing that every weekend and not necessarily focusing on where I want to go with this. Um, I wouldn't be where I am. So obviously it's, um, yeah, like the dedication, the hard work that obviously gets put into it. It shows, it shows in obviously some of the, or in the results that I've gotten in the last few years. And, um, yeah, that's probably the biggest, biggest thing I've learned. You're talking about like, being hard, what do you think the biggest thing you've had to overcome with within either racing or just life really in general that you've had to go, okay, this is hard, but I need to work through this to, to make it better? Um, in racing, it's probably just injuries, to be honest. Um, I've, I've, I have been very lucky with injuries, but there's been a few that have set me back a long way. and. Um, and it's more of the mental thing, even after you've come back from it, it's always in the corner of your head thinking about um, what could go wrong. Um, and you can't be thinking about that when you're trying to go as fast as you can and obviously uh, compete to the best you can. But um, yeah, injuries have been a sort of a big thing to think about. And, and the motivation off and on, um, obviously uh, the calendar's massive and a lot of people obviously don't, don't think about it, but in off-road we do so many different races and our, our season is packed and by the end of the year you're pretty well worn out, but um, obviously reminding yourself during the year why, well, why I do it, I like riding bikes and uh, at the end of the day, although we're going racing every weekend and you don't have time to go hang out with your mates and do all your normal stuff, um, yeah, as much as I love it, it just sort of keeps that keeps it going I guess mm. yeah it keeps that drive yeah no nah, it's I, I totally agree I was gonna say with um, with you saying this championship this year it came down to a few seconds as well and you were saying it was like such a mental game in that how do you like what was what we what was going through your head at those like that last stage and like how did you process that and how did you deal with it and then come out and obviously win yeah, I'd, I just tried not to put as much pressure on myself as I could. Um, I know I can do it. I'm like, I know, I know what I can do. And uh, yeah, at the end of the day, I before I, before I took off, I knew is this last sprint I'll ride as best as I can. Um, if 
if the other person comes out on top, great. That's good for them. They've ridden better on the day, and that's that's as much as it is. As sort of you can't you can't beat yourself up. So I was trying to just take as little uh, as much pressure off my shoulders as I could. Obviously, there was a lot. I was um, not happy with how I rode on the Saturday at that last race. I got second by only a couple seconds, and I needed a first and a second over the weekend to wrap up the championship. So I left left it right down to that last day. And I knew at the start of the day, I just had to come out as fast as I could. What have I got to lose? I'm, you're either going to win or come second. No, yeah. that's, that's it. And I sort of obviously just tried to go as fast as I could those first few and got a little bit of a gap and then just tried to maintain that all day. Um, Is it be easy to it. get ahead of yourself, hey? Because yeah. once you've got that gap, you've got to then, do I manage this? Do I kind of keep pushing? If I overthink it, could then yeah. that's when a mistake will happen? Like, yeah, well, and if you, try, if you try and ride conservative, you don't realise how slow you're going. Yeah. You come back in after that test and you've been leapfrogged by five or six seconds. You go, crap, now I've got to obviously turn that around and go again. So I was sort of all day, um, Stefan and myself are, we're riding as best as we as best we have all year, so we're just battling back and forth and obviously um, pushing each other as yeah to the limit. Mm. But like you said, that was such a good feeling as well. Yeah, yeah, coming across that line was the biggest relief, I guess. I come across and finished, and then rode straight down to the uh, to the old scoring tent, <laughs> and obviously had the big screen there. And then when I seen my time pop up. And then Stefan was behind me as well, so I had to go off first, and he had to, he got to chase me. So I was sort of, I didn't know until so you're just waiting. He, so I seriously rode down at the score tent, and you just sitting there, just watching it, watching it, watching it, watching it. And then I seen the time pop up, and he actually beat me in that sprint. But um, you had a gap. Yeah, but I had that little gap, and yeah, it ended up. Yeah, it was it was nothing, but it was the biggest relief, I guess, more than anything. It's like, <laughs> Oh shit! What oh. was? Did you remember the time? Like how many seconds you got in by? Uh, I think it was twelve over the whole day. And how many over? How long's the or, or the total? Uh, time it would have been oh, three or four hours, I guess. <laughs> yeah, and twelve seconds. And that was <laughs> twelve it. Twelve seconds in three hours. Yeah, and that, that's it. And I was. Yeah, <laughs> like you say, like a bike drop. That's it. Just dropping the bike once. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. If you like, it's so easy to sort of spin out a little bit and that's a couple seconds and then if you dropped it once and there's that all that time gone mm. so it's um and even just even like mechanicals and that if if you drop it and you snap a lever or a clutch or something if you if you snap a clutch out on the track you're pretty well knackered like you can't you can't get going or sort of get over obstacles and logs in motocross you could probably half cruise around and make it work but on off-road you can't like mm. sort of you go too slow and you stole it and you go too fast and you're in the bushes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was day over. Yeah, a hundred percent. So it was um Yeah, it was it was a relief more than anything, that's for sure. It's funny how that works, hey, it's like you finish something and it's like you're more relieved than excited. Like you're yeah. excited when you're racing and then at the end it's almost just like, Oh, I'm glad that's done. Then yeah. like, you're glad you got it done at that the was, same time. That was honestly the exact feeling everyone's getting more excited I'm just like shit I'm gonna sit down I've been racing yeah, I'm, all day. I'm dead I'm, I'm dead done. Yeah, I'm leave done I've, I've just given up my everything yeah. I'm out. I need to like, go have a snooze yeah do you want to celebrate no I want to have a nap <laughs> yeah that was exactly how it was yeah I know the I know the feeling what's um okay what's the goal now for obviously you've gone to America what would be your ultimate if you look at the future, where, where do you want to see yourself? Because I remember you kind of talked about possibly going to Europe as well, maybe racing yeah. over there. Is there one in particular or a certain path you want to go down or do you just want to continue to race in Australia if you could make that a full-time thing? Like if you could see your, I guess, perfect future, where would you want it to fall? Yeah, racing, racing motorbikes in Australia. Um, the money isn't quite there to make it a proper career. Um, so obviously the, the goal is to eventually go overseas. Um, America's just lined up because we've made a few great connections over there. So although it's not easy, it was easier than going over to Europe. Um, and obviously I'm only going over there for a month and a bit to sort of do a few races and just and experience it. So obviously I want to do the same thing over in Europe and obviously maybe next year or in a couple of years or whatever, I'd love to obviously have all the money together to be able to 
then go over to Europe and do the same thing, go over there and do a few races and experience it and try to get your name out and do a few, uh, make some connections. I don't uh, necessarily know what what series would probably suit me more. Um, over in Europe, they run the enduro sort of style riding all year at all of their races. Mm. Um, so they do the time cards and obviously all your special tests. And in Europe, they're probably a lot more technical, um, which probably would suit my riding. Um, in America, it's a lot probably wider track, not necessarily as technical, but different. They The American tracks get a lot more rough. They have um, massive numbers of riders at their events. They run quads. They uh, There's a few different things, obviously, that uh, make it step out from from the rest and they're two sort of completely different riding styles so I'd like to go do both and see what works and see what I enjoy the most and then um, yeah obviously if an opportunity arises in the future I'd love to sort of move over there and try and have a good good go at it. Mm. Yeah that's the thing I guess it's hard to make it a call when you haven't done yeah. either of them yet. Yeah, hundred yeah. percent. And you've got different things that work against and for and whatnot. America, America is really cool. America is cool just because it's, it's very similar to Australia in the culture and how the people come across. And Europe, yeah. Europe's amazing, but the language barrier is a big factor, and the culture is a big factor as well. So yeah, yeah. But like I said, ex definitely go learn and experience it, and you'll know what works for you best. But yeah, I think it's both pretty cool options at, at the same time. Yeah, hundred percent. They're both. Uh, pretty exciting sort of looking into and um, obviously I follow both series a lot and watch, well, look at all the riders there, all the people overseas is what you look up to and where you want to sort of be all those top riders. Um, but for the minute, obviously, my goals are just back here in, in, in Australia, um, just trying to obviously do my best and keep trying to tick off, just keep better on all my results. That's, that's sort of my goal every year. I don't necessarily have a massive expectation all I want to do is just be better every year mm. and um, and you can obviously see if you sort of follow along through through the results every year sort of in out all the state titles my number's been dropping every year so that's sort of you have to run uh, what position you get in the year prior mm. um, at nationals we obviously just hold our uh, whatever number you want um, but um, yeah obviously just trying to uh, get championships together and trying to get as many race wins and keep building connections and sort of making a little bit more of a name for myself. Mm. No, it's definitely the time to be doing it. And who is, who is the guy to say when you go to the States? Who's the kind of the man right now that you would say, not look, maybe not look up to, but who is the guy that's like, okay, that's, that's where I want to be? Um, I'll probably look up to the Aussie guys over there doing, obviously, uh, they're not necessarily at the top mm. but they're the people over there that are obviously doing what I want to do there they've gone over there and obviously done the hard yards for a few years it's it's a lot of obviously it's it's pretty hard obviously designating your life and moving everything over there and just living um, away from home that sort of thing so uh, Lindo Lyndon Snodgrass he's from down in like Yarra Valley there mm. and he obviously um, yeah rode KDM and that in Australia and he was sort of um, yeah on the KDM factory team right there when I uh, when I was sort of just coming out of juniors and then he obviously went overseas he's been, been over there yeah th three or so years now and he uh, has had some unreal uh, results and then Gus Reardon is my age and uh, Will Reardon the brothers they uh, moved over there right when I was obviously in juniors um, so I never really raced against them a lot here, but obviously over there they've been uh, smashing it and sort of uh, Gus is now on the factory KD, KDM team on 250s and Will's on the factory gas gas team uh, doing all that hard enduro and super enduro. Yeah. So um, I've got to pave, of, pave in the way for what you want to do. Yeah, 100%. And there's obviously even more like Josh Strang's have been over there and done a lot. So. So obviously, yeah, watching all those sort of Aussie boys, you want to get a, be a part of it a little bit and go over there and try and uh, do what you can. Mm. And what bike are you going to be on when you go over? Something I've never ridden before. <laughs> yeah, you were saying that, and I was just like, what? So what's the what's the go with that? Yeah, I've uh, I've sort of I didn't I didn't want to ride a two fifty. I've uh, I feel like 
all over here. I ride a 500, obviously, and uh, my riding style, and um, probably my weight a little bit and that sort of thing. I, I feel like I suit a bigger bike a little bit better. Um, I've obviously got a 450 here, and I've been riding that a fair bit. Um, but I feel like a 350 is a lighter 450. It's still got like the power there, obviously, and and over there for that style of racing, I've looked into it a lot, and I feel like a 350 would be a uh, awesome bike choice for it. Um, it's obviously uh, not going to be a bad thing. I reckon it'll be a good thing going riding a little bike. It'll be a lot lighter for me, um, so you'll be able to chuck it around and sort of manoeuvre your way through the bush. But obviously, it's got a lot a lot of power for uh, the sort of race that I'm doing. Over here in Australia, our tracks are sort of, depends on where you go, but for the most part, we're a bit more open and fast sort of style racing. Mm. Um, over there, it'll be a little bit more technical and slow and big ruts and super rough tracks. So I think, um, yeah, 350 would sort of be a uh, perfect choice for it. I've, I've ridden one once, I had a, uh, I was going to get a 450 over there and I was set on that and then I had a mate come up on a 350 and I rode it and I did a couple track, a couple laps down the bottom and a couple laps up the top and I was like, nah, nah, I'm getting a 350 now. I think that's now. better, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Especially with your height and stuff, I feel like to be able to manoeuvre bikes through, like you say, deeper ruts and stuff, you want to be a bit more nimble on it and actually throw it around a bit more. Yeah, 100%. So I'm sort of, I'm getting one very soon and then, uh, then the testing will be like begin I guess I've sort of I'm a bit late to uh pull back on the decision now but I've or I, I believe it's the right choice so um as soon as I've got it then it's just uh straight into testing I've obviously got all the suspension and that sorted and then um yeah just start testing and getting the bike styled in and getting used to it and putting a few hours on it over here so yeah I'll just be trying to do as many hours as I can over the next few weeks and then uh go over there and I've sort of uh over there for five weeks, but we got three races. So I've got to race the first weekend I'm over there. Straight in the deep end. Yeah, so straight in the deep end. So that first one will be a bit of a learning learning race, but I'm hoping those, the GNCC will be the last race while I'm there. So I'm going to try and use those first ones as a bit of learning and testing mm. and, um, yeah, just keep obviously trying to grow on that. And then once I get back, I'm back on all 500. So, <laughs> so jump off the little bike and then we straight back onto a big bike. And uh, yeah, and then I'll obviously try and hang on to that 350 all year and do a lot of time on it as well. Cause obviously I want to try and go back over there and do more, more maybe this year, maybe next. So I'll sort of just wait and see what happens. Kind of depends how they go, hey, you're going to get over there. And if you do really well, doors open pretty quickly. Yeah, that's right. It's I've obviously, uh, I've signed to race all the Australian stuff. So I'll be here all year yeah. and I'll, I'll have to be at every single round of our series. Um, but yeah, where the, there is a few calendar gaps open enough and I've, I've uh, got them all written down in a calendar just to sort of see if I can make it work. And um, it'll sort of play it by ear a little bit if it pops up um yeah I'd, I'd love to obviously then potentially shoot back over but see where, what happens where are the races you are going to yeah uh, the these first few are uh, all uh i'm not the southeast so we'll be down i'll be staying in carolina and then um they'll be down like florida carolina sort of area down yeah. on like the southeast on the east coast obviously of america yeah Go to oh, Miami, yeah. go to Florida, be in Florida, That'll be exactly live, live right. it up for a little bit. Yeah, no, I don't even have time for that. I was, <laughs> I was planning to try and have a, a have a week at the end of the at the end of the trip, but um, yeah, our race season, I'll be uh, straight back and I'll have about a week. Busy schedules. Hey? Yeah, so I'll get back and then have a week and I'll be straight back on. So I'll have to have a week off work and just ride a five hundred for a few days before <laughs> get straight to into our first nationals. True. You're probably not going to like it. You come back, this thing is too heavy. Yeah, Get I my know. little bike back. Yeah, yeah. Well, but you probably just need that extra power here, hey? Yeah. Extra go just because of the format of how we race in Oz. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent. Have you have you did have you ever thought about that though? Like racing a smaller bike in Australia? Yeah, we've uh, oh, grown up in juniors. Obviously, you're, you're capped at a two fifty. So I've grown up. I've ridden a I had a one fifty two stroke for a bit, mm. like KDMs, and then I've ridden a few 250s while I was still in juniors and then since then I've had a I never had a 350 but I had a 450 and then obviously uh 
I've ridden a 500 for a long time now, and now I've got a 450 motocross bike. Mm. Um, but yeah, I've sort of pretty well ridden ridden the whole range, and I haven't raced, but I've ridden a lot of two strokes as well. So I've played around on a few like 300s and 250 two strokes and that sort of thing. You also grown another like compared to when you would have been riding them when you were younger like how tall are you now yeah six, oh, six, four. six four yeah so <laughs> yeah yeah i don't i don't yeah i don't reckon a uh 250 would necessarily suit my riding style mm. uh, i got nothing against them but i guess if if you had to ride one you'd just get used to it and you'd do as best you can but it's a completely different kind of riding style i don't I don't like revving, revving the crap out of it and sort of swinging off a bike. I like to uh, be a lot more sort of calm and collected, I, I guess. Um, obviously, you're still going to be really aggressive and attack your corners and whatnot, but I like to think I'd try and flow and be a bit more smooth. Um, where on a 250, although you can flow and be smooth, you have to be uh, pretty well on it the whole time. Yeah, smooth and revving. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> there's a lot of revving. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, dude, I think we'll wrap it up. I was going to say, before we wrap it up, anyone you want to thank in particular for just either, like, mum, dad, sponsors, oh, brother? Thank, thank you, Donny. <laughs> Rock, for rocking up. Yeah, thanks for showing up on Sh showing the up, day yeah. before you fly back. Yeah, I thought I'd try and catch up with everyone. I thought, I mean, well, we were meaning to do this ages ago. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah. We've been uh, talking about it on and off for, like, a couple of years, I guess. Yeah, I know. Just been... before just before you left to head up, we are like, yeah, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. But yeah. then something happens and you... Everyone, we're going, we're both traveling around doing mm. something, and then yeah, that's it's been a long time coming. <laughs> it's funny, you know, when you think something's going to be easy to do, you never do it because yeah. it's like I live there, you live there, oh, I'll do it tomorrow, and yeah, then tomorrow, oh, no, and then we'll do it tomorrow, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it just keeps getting pushed, pushed to the back, side. pushed back. Now, we're, uh, now we're living at opposite ends of the country, yeah, and um, I think it just shows you if you can do something, just do it. Yeah, because you know you don't know when you might not be able to. Yeah, if there's an opportunity there, take it while yeah. you can. Because um, yeah, like you said, you never know when it sort of mm. when you pop them back down to do another one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, we definitely have to do another one. We we'll do another yeah. one when you signed your deal with uh, whoever, and you're in the state. You're about to move to the states and <laughs> the full time gear. In a year's time, we'll do the yearly catch up. Yeah, we'll do it. But I think, dude, like I said, I think it's a really exciting time for like you're about to go into. Like I think back when I was 19 and going to Europe and getting into the racing side of things and like I obviously raced for 11 years and like those first few years were still the best. Oh, yeah. And I was sleeping on the floor of a van some nights and you, had, you were eating um, kebabs twice a day. Yeah. And you just, it's all like looking back, like I, I probably wouldn't want to do it again. I, I don't do it anymore. But at the time when you're 18, 19 and you're with your buddies and you're in a new place and everything's exciting and you just make it work. Like, yeah, you don't get so caught up on all the little things that you you don't really, you, they're good to have, but you don't need them. Yeah, well, So I, I think it's just learn, take what you can get and smile and have fun. It's just simple as that. That's, that's the plan, that's yeah. for sure. <laughs> and I reckon you can do it. I reckon it's easy. Yeah. It's, right. as, it's as easy as that. Just go over and win, eh? Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's nah. what everyone else is trying to do, so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Brother Gilbray. Thank, thank you, you very thank much. Thank you for jumping on. My neck is actually, um, that's why I slowly started like. Coming up. Coming, lounging down. I've actually, I, th I don't know what I've done. I think I've been sleeping with a pillow that's, you know when you sleep with not your pillow? Yeah. And it's your neck. That's a thing. Okay, when you go to America, take your pillow with you. Yeah, right. I, I, I preach, I, I absolutely preach this. And when I went to Europe, the pillows are always really bad. America's kind of better. Europe's really bad. They have really thin pillows. Yeah. And I would go over there and I'd, I'd have the worst sleeps because I had these shitty pillows. Yeah. And it was really affecting my racing because I was always tired. Yeah. And then I'm like, I'm just going to take my pillow from home. And I had the best sleeps and everyone on the team gave me shit for it because like, I was always carrying my pillow around. And yeah. they're like, why are you bringing your pillow? I'm like, I can sleep way better. The pillows here suck. They always suck. Next year, everyone brought their own pillows. <laughs> and I was just like, see? Yeah, they bag you out until you bring your <laughs> Until they realize yeah. that they're like, I had, a, I had a shit sleep. And I'm like, yeah, we always have shit sleep. So pillows are terrible. Yeah. But that comes back to that thing. It's just like being curious and then um, looking at yourself and going, okay, what can I do better? I'll take a note of what's not working and yeah, fix it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and it's something sleep. as small as like taking a pillow. Yeah. But then, okay. A pillow's not important, but sleep's important. Getting nine hours or eight hours 
is important. If you're tired and you're about to do a three hour race, yeah. that's 12 seconds right there. So yeah, 100%. Easy as that. All right, Mr. McGilbro. Perfect. Oh, <laughs> comfiest podcast ever done. We still bloody oath. We still recording. Oh, we're still going. Oh, it's got it's gotten a bit dark though, but that's all right.